For six years, Guns N' Roses would be one of the biggest bands in the world, thanks to their debut record in 1987's Appetite for Destruction and their epic 1991 double albums Use Your Illusion 1 and 2. The band spent nearly two and a half years on the road promoting their double album until the summer of 1993. They would put out what would be their final studio album featuring frontman Axl Rose, guitar Slash, and bassist Duff McKagan in November of 1993, a covers album called The Spaghetti Incident. The next 15 years would see band members come and go, various lawsuits, failed tours, disputes with their record label, and dashed hopes. But the end result would be an album that sounded drastically different than what people expected Guns N' Roses to be. Today, let's talk about the most expensive album in music history. Guns N' Roses frontman Axl Rose would give an interview to Hit Parader in the summer of 1993, where he was asked about the next GNR album, to which he responded, We really haven't sat down to collaborate on songs yet. I've been working on where my head's at on things, so I can approach the next record in a way that lets me go to farther extremes. However, he would reveal that he did write one song at the time, saying, I wrote and recorded a new love song that I want on the next record called This I Love. That's the heaviest thing I've ever done. From 1991 to early 1993, Rose would date model Stephanie Seymour, who appeared in the videos for Don't Cry and November Rain. Rose had planned on marrying her and grew close to her son Dylan, who can be seen in the video for Estranged. However, the relationship fell apart by early 93 and both parties would sue one another. Rose's failed relationship with Seymour weighed heavily on him, as did the departure of his ex-bandmates, and that formed the basis for a lot of Chinese democracy. By late 1993, Slash would end up writing and recording a handful of tracks with drummer Matt Sorum and guitarist Kilby Clark, recalling to Metal Edge. We would write these songs in one night. When I first started writing stuff, Matt and I would get together. Here's the riff, here's that riff. We'd finally get from point A to B and put it all together and leave it at that. There wasn't a lot of orchestration like November Rain. There were no vocals on it at that point, but the songs were arranged. It would result in 14 tracks that Slash had by early 1994 that he presented to Axel for what he thought would form the basis of the next GNR album. However, Axel and bassist Duff McKagan would take a profound disinterest in the new material, thinking it was too southern rock. Slash, upset, would take the tracks and started his own side project called Snake Pit, which was made up of Matt, Gilby, frontman Eric Dover, and Alice in Chains bassist Mike Inez. In fact, Slash would write some of the lyrics to the songs, Remarking in his book, I think it's pretty easy to tell which songs he wrote referring to Eric Dover and which ones I wrote. All of my songs were directed at one person, though no one picked up on it at the time. I used the record as an opportunity to vent a lot of shit that I needed to get off my chest. Axel would end up coming back to Slash and wanted to use three or four of the songs, but the guitars claimed it was too late as they had already been recorded. In fact, at one point, Rose threatened to sue his guitarist to get the songs back, but thankfully cooler heads prevailed. Slash would release his first Snake Pit album called It's 5 O'Clock Somewhere in February of 95, and he would tell Rock Hard Magazine in 2000 where Axel's head was at musically, saying Axel didn't really care because he only wanted to play industrial and Pearl Jam sounding crap. Rose, however, had a different version of events, writing on a fan forum in 2008. I didn't walk until several months after having three to four hour phone conversations nearly every day with Slash, trying to reach a compromise. I was specifically told no lyrics, no melodies, no changes to anything, and to sing what I was told or F off. Going on in the background during this time was that the band in late 1994 got an offer to record a cover of the Rolling Stones song Sympathy for the Devil for the interview with the Vampire movie. Slash had hoped the opportunity would get the band back in the studio and lead to them writing new material, but the effort proved to be futile, as the guitarist told a British interviewer here. Tom Cruise, as the start, I don't think so. I think it's going to be pretty lousy. But I went to go see the screening anyway, as a favor. And the Stones version was in there at the time. And I thought it's fine, because the movie bored me to tears. I can't stand this any longer. And Axel, of course, always being my nemesis, right, went and saw it and loved it. So he goes, let's do the song. So I thought, well, it'd be a great vehicle to uh, get everybody's uh, uh, creative juices flowing and sort of start getting geared towards the next Guns record. Unhappy family. And then Axel went on to go do the vocals and he brought another guitar player with him who's a guy that's from Indiana who I can't stand and he sort of added a little rhythm guitar there 
But he also put little answers on my guitar solo, my first one. There's two solos in the song. The first one, if you listen to it, you'll hear my guitar and then you'll hear this little tinny little thing in the background. And so that me off. Monster. As a result, we ended up doing another cover song of a song that didn't need to be covered for a lame movie and it didn't do anything for the band. So it was an effort made, but an effort that was wasted too. By late 1994, Rose would fire Gilby Clark, who joined the band three years prior, to replace original guitarist Izzy Stradlin. Rose would bring in his childhood friend from Indiana, a guitar player named Paul Hughey, without consulting the other members to play rhythm guitar. But former manager Doug Goldstein would tell GNR Central that Hughey was never meant to be a full-time replacement, but instead was supposed to be a temporary fill-in until Slash and Duff found a replacement, but they never really suggested one according to him. Despite having left the band in 1991, Stradlin was important in acting as the glue that held the band together. Guns N' Roses were embarking on writing their first album without Izzy, and Slash would write what that experience was like in his 2007 autobiography, saying, By that point, the support group I'd always enjoyed to help me deal with Axel was gone. Izzy was the last one in the band who could have gotten through to him creatively. Between Duff and me, we just didn't have the proper tools to communicate with him effectively. Prior to Slash hitting the road with Snake Pit, Axel offered Aussie guitarist Zach Wilde the opportunity to jam with the band in January of 95, but the sessions didn't do much to alleviate the problems within the group, as Slash told a French interviewer here. Back, right? And I was like, well, yeah, but we don't sound right. It's, it doesn't sound right with like two heavy lead guitar players. Um, there's no, usually Guns N' Roses has an, an off rhythm and a main lead yeah. sort of riff. So now me and Zach just play the same thing. Right. Slash would be on the road from February to August of 95. Bassist Duff McKagan, who is now sober, after nearly dying due to his pancreas exploding the previous year, wrote in a column for the Seattle Weekly in 2009 what was going on during this time, saying, My band Guns N' Roses was in shambles and suddenly the dynamic had changed. The challenge was how we were going to make a new record and what direction we were going to go musically. We couldn't very well do anything at the time because Slash was out doing a snake pit tour and battling his own addiction. In previous years, there had seemed to be a fail-proof alliance and understanding within the band. We knew at the end of the day, we only had each other to rely on. That sense of family and trust had recently been tainted by management dealings and other wedges that did everything possible to vanquish our bonds. To help out the band while Slash was away would be old bandmate Izzy Stradlin. While not a returning member at the time, he and Duff would write a handful of songs in the middle of 1995, but Izzy didn't want to deal with being in the band in an official capacity and soon split after him and Rose had a quarrel over their past history. By August of 95, Rose would send a letter to McKagan and Slash, claiming that he was leaving the band and taking the name with him. He would form a new band called Guns N' Roses, but Duff and Slash were offered to join, but they could only serve as employees. The band attempted to write on and off throughout the rest of 1995 and 1996, but by October of 96, things were done with Slash and he quit the band. On those final rehearsals with Rose, Slash would remark in his book that there was a lot of jamming, but Axel never sang, but merely hung out in the studio. He was soon followed by Duff McKagan, who quit the following year, and Matt Sorum, who was fired after sticking up for Slash during an argument with Rose. By the summer of 1997, Rose was now at the helm of Guns N' Roses and had to assemble a completely new band, which he did. He would bring in guitarist Robin Fink, drummer Josh Fries, bassist Tommy Stinson, his old friend Paul Tobias would stick around, and the incredible keyboardist Chris Rock and Roll Pittman would also join the group. By late 1997, Moby was brought onto the project to possibly produce the next Guns album, which didn't have a title yet. Moby would tell All Star in 1997, at the risk of sounding like a sleazy music biz guy, I met with Axel last week to hear their new demos. They're writing a lot of loops, and believe it or not, they're doing it better than anybody I've heard lately. Moby's time, though, would be short-lived on the project, and here's what he told SiriusXM looking back at that time. Yeah, well, you know, for a brief moment, I was pegged to be the producer of Chinese Democracy. <laughs> so I spent some time with Axel and the band at that point in Los Angeles, and I eventually decided that I wasn't the right person to produce it, but... I did get a first-hand look into, you know, the mind of Axel, and it's a very, it's a very interesting place. And he actually made me feel quite paternal. Like I almost wanted to sort of protect him in a way because he seemed very vulnerable. Was to that me. when he was trying to go for the pseudo-industrial sound of uh, of Guns N' Roses, or was or were you going to try to make a straight-ahead rock record with him? This was '98. 
or 97. And I, I did make one suggestion that didn't go over too well. Because at this point, even by 97 or 98, they had spent a lot of money on it. And I said, how about this? Rent a crummy studio on the Lower East Side and spend two weeks in the studio. And at the end of those two weeks, you release what you've made. And you record the tape. You don't use Pro Tools. You don't use anything. And you make it the way you made Appetite for Destruction. And uh, no one in the Guns N' Roses camp liked that idea very much. Oh my God. By 1998, Geffen Records, the band's label, was hungry for a new album, and they had already spent millions of dollars having nothing to show for it. It was reported that the band was even offered a $10 million advance on the album, but it didn't produce results. James Barber, an A&R man for Geffen at the time, would recall to Pop Tones in 2005. Nothing else had worked, so Geffen figured they'd send me in to talk to Axel after I moved to LA. No expense was spared. They were the biggest band in the history of the label, and even though everyone except Axel was gone, Geffen Records lived and breathed for another GNR album. We desperately wanted the new album for Christmas 98, and I had a year to get it finished. Hampering the process was that Rose decided he wanted the new lineup to re-record Appetite for Destruction. But the frontman would defend this decision telling Kurt Loder of MTV in 1999, learning the old Guns N' Roses songs and getting them up, you know, putting them on tape, really forced everybody to get them up to the quality that they needed to be. I don't know what I'm going to do with the re-recorded Appetite, or when I would be putting that out, but you know what, it has a lot of energy. Once the energy was figured out by the new guys, how much energy was needed to get the songs right, then it really helped in the writing and recording process of the new record. Also hampering the recording and costing the label a lot of money was that Rose kept a pretty unpredictable schedule. Engineer Dave Dominguez would reveal Axel would be on for a couple weeks and then off for a couple weeks. He called in pretty much every day though. He'd ask who was there and what they were doing. He'd say to tell them, I'm coming in, I'll be there in a while. I'd tell the band Axel called and he's coming in. Oftentimes he'd never show up, but then when he did, Axel would show up at 2 a.m. or 2.30 a.m. and no one would be around. He got upset. The New York Times even documented how costs spiraled out of control, writing, one internal cost analysis from that period pegs the operations monthly tab at a staggering $244,000. It included more than $50,000 in studio time at the Village. It also included a combined payroll for seven band members that exceeded $62,000, with the star players earning roughly $11,000 each. Guitar technicians earned about $6,000 per month. While well, the album's main engineer was paid $14,000 per month and a recording software engineer was paid $25,000 a month. One of the early producers of the album would be Killing Joke's bassist Youth. Youth would do something that no other label person or even other producer at the time had been capable of doing, and that was getting Axel to sing. He would tell Q Magazine, I went to his house and we started writing songs, strumming guitars in the kitchen. There was a major breakthrough because I got him singing again, which he hadn't done for a long time. He would tell the New York Times in a separate interview, he hadn't been singing for around 18 months. I think the record had turned into a real labor. He was stuck and didn't know how to proceed, so he was avoiding it. He had some brilliant ideas, but they were really just sketches. He really wanted to leave the past behind and make a hugely ambitious album like Led Zeppelin's Physical Graffiti crossed with Pink Floyd's Dark Side of the Moon. It was around this time that sketches or ideas of songs were starting to form, including the tracks Madagascar, Prostitute, a tune called Oklahoma, and The Ides of March. While progress with youth was going well, the producer pushed Rose to begin recording the songs in the studio, something the singer pushed back against, claiming he wasn't ready. Despite being promised extra royalties by Geffen to deliver an album, youth soon left the project, seeing no end in sight. A&R man James Barber would reveal that by 1999, the bulk of the music was recorded, adding to pop tones, the record just needed a lead vocal and a mix. If Axel had recorded vocals, it would have been an absolutely contemporary record in 1999. 1999 would see Geffen merge with Interscope, and suddenly job cuts hit the label. The people Axel was dealing with would either leave or were fired, and Interscope struggled to really have any hit albums, putting even more pressure on them to get the next Guns N' Roses album out. Added to the mix was that Jimmy Iovine was now on the project, and he wanted more oversight over what Guns N' Roses were doing in the studio and how much money they were spending. The same year would see guitarist Robin Fink leave the group, and Buckethead soon came into the fold, while Queen's Roger Taylor contributed a guitar track to the song Catcher on the Rye. Nine Inch Nails and Marilyn Manson producer Sean Bevan soon joined the project and would be on the album for the next two years. By late 1998, according to the New York Times, Axel would be offered another $1 million advance if he could have the album out by March of 1999, something he obviously failed to do. Disappointed, the label opted to put out a live GNR album to recoup some of their investment. 
The year 2000 would see more changes. Drummer Josh Fries and Sean Bevan would leave the project, with Fries giving his reason to Potomatic saying, I left because we were in year two of sitting in the studio and the record still didn't look like it was going to be done anytime soon. So I was getting frustrated and discouraged like a lot of people. Queen producer Roy Thomas Baker was brought in to help wrap things up, and Baker spent even more money requiring everything to be re-recorded, with the New York Times reporting that a few bars of music would take up to eight hours to redo. It was around 2001 that Axel felt the album was done and ready to mix, but things didn't go that way. Rose would tell Rock and Pop FM in 2001, every time we thought we had the correct songs, then somebody in the record company thought we could make it better. Soon enough, Roy Thomas Baker was off the project, and Rose became the producer of the album alongside Karim Costanzo. 2002 saw the band appear at the MTV Video Music Awards, a performance that was largely criticized due to Rose's vocals. It was following this performance that the band hit the road for their longest tour since the User Illusion days, but things quickly came apart after a dozen or so dates due to mediocre ticket sales and two riots happening in Vancouver and Philadelphia, resulting in promoter Clear Channel pulling the plug. However, fans would get to hear some new tracks from Rose and Company, including Street of Dreams, the title track, and Madagascar. The band's label announced an intention to release the album in 2003, but that came and went. In 2003, Buckethead decided to leave the band, and the group had to cancel their 2004 planned appearance at the Rock and Rio Festival. By 2004, Interscope decided that they had had enough and pulled all funding for the album, and told Rose that it was his responsibility to finish up the album and finance it himself. It was the same year that Interscope put out a Greatest Hits album from Guns N' Roses to recoup some of their investment and despite having little to no promotion, it peaked at number three on the album charts, and to this day has sold millions of copies. Funny enough, Axel Slash and Duff would follow a lawsuit against Interscope's parent company Universal to stop its release, but they failed to do so. By 2005, band member Tommy Stinson would tell an interviewer, they're finishing up the mixing right now, sorting out what songs going on it, and artwork and shit, and hopefully sooner than later it'll come out. I understand there's probably some European dates booked in the summer. Well, those dates would come and go, and no tour would happen, and the album was once again nowhere in sight. Also not helping during this time was that there was a lawsuit involving Rose and his former bandmate Slash and Duff over song publishing and royalties. The New York Times would publish an article the same year, detailing the making of Chinese democracy, claiming that $13 million had been spent on the album so far. The following year saw the band reveal their new guitarist Bumblefoot, who replaced Buckethead. In 2006, the band toured extensively as it appeared the album was finally on the horizon, with the band debuting a few new songs at live shows. But 2006 and 2007 came and went, and it was in 2007 former Skid Row frontman and friend of Rose Sebastian Bach would tell Blabbermouth, Axel was playing me the new Chinese Democracy album, actually there's more than one, there's like four. By early 2008, it seemed like the album was now in the hands of Interscope and done. Eddie, I Know Everybody Trunk would reveal on a show. I hear the new GNR CD is actually done, but the delay in release is not the band's issue, but the label. There's so much money tied up in this record that in today's business, it'll be virtually impossible to be profitable, meaning the label might want to sell it off, but cannot find a buyer since nobody buys CDs anymore. Problem might not be Axel's this time around, and might keep the CD in limbo for years to come. Hopefully it gets resolved. The same year Rose would sign with heavyweight manager Irving Asoff, who represented Van Halen and the Eagles, to settle his disputes with his label and help get the album out. A deal would be worked out with Best Buy to sell the album exclusively through their stores in America, and the song Shackler's Revenge, which previously hadn't been heard, would make its debut on the video game Rock Band 2 as an on-disc track. November 23, 2008 would soon be confirmed as the album's release date. It would be 15 years to the date since the last studio album Guns N' Roses had put out, which was the Spaghetti Incident. Chinese Democracy would debut at number 3 on the Billboard 200 charts, selling around 261,000 copies in its first week of release. The album's disappointing sales were chalked up due to a lack of promotion by Rose, and the band didn't even bother touring on the album until a year after it came out. In the aftermath of its release, Rose would appear on several Guns N' Roses forums taking fan questions and writing several open letters, putting the blame on the label for not presenting him with a good marketing plan. But to date, the album has sold in excess of 5 million copies worldwide. Chinese Democracy stands as the last studio recording released by the band, who have toured extensively since 2009. Slash and Duff would rejoin Guns N' Roses in late 2015, 
and the band has been on tour ever since. But the members in various interviews have said that they are working on some of the leftover songs from Chinese Democracy Sessions, two of which they've actually released, including Absurd and Hard School. Those songs were even performed live by the band to this very day. So let me know in the comment section, guys, what your thoughts are on the album. And as always, be sure to hit the like button and subscribe if you haven't done so. Take care.